Hi, my, my name, name is, is Hannah Rosen. I'm here from uh, com and Atlantic Magazine. And uh, with me today I have Barbara Ehrenreich, who is the author of the new book Bright Sided, How the Relentless Promotion of Positive Thinking Has Undermined America. And she's the author of several other books about American culture, including uh, the bestseller Nickel and Dimed. Um, and we are going to be talking about Bright Sided today. Uh, and so, um, hi, Barbara, welcome. Hi. Just say hello. Hi. Um, so th- the first thing I want to do, uh, I thought this was a really, really brilliant frame for a book. It never occurred to me. I mean, one thing that this book did beautifully for me is connect the dots between what is kind of the background noise of American culture, you know, sort of negative people suck bumper stickers, kind of motivational speaking, um, uh, 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 a, a certain kind of positive theology. I mean, all these things that I know about and we all know about but had never thought about how they were connected. So I think I want to start by just asking you, what do you mean by positive thinking? You're not just talking about, you know, thinking positively. You're you're speaking about an actual movement in American culture. So can you just describe what it is? Well, it's it's an ideology uh, which says that you should be cheerful and upbeat and optimistic at all times and that if you're not, you better get to work on becoming more cheerful and upbeat uh, and optimistic. Uh, And this is, uh, it dates back to the mid-19th century um, as a movement, if you want to call it that, and that isn't a bad word either. It's um, the proselytizers are the motivational speakers, a lot of the life coaches, career coaches, uh, all the proponents of what I call positive theology, which includes the prosperity gospel preachers, and... uh, all too often, it includes the, uh, as an academic wing, the uh, so-called positive psychologists who uh, attempt to provide some academic legitimacy for this. Right, and that's the more modern incarnation. I mean, this movement spans about a century, and we'll get into the history of it in a moment. Um, but first, I want to ask you, just to give readers a touch point, um, talk about how you first encountered this kind of in your own personal life. This really resonated with me because my closest friend uh, also had breast cancer recently, went through chemotherapy, and was just like, mortified in all of her support groups and had an extremely similar experience to you. So can you just talk about what happened after you were diagnosed and just say when it was? Yeah, this was eight years ago I, um, when I went through uh, treatment for breast cancer. Uh, and, you know, my first impulse, of course, was to reach out uh, for support uh, from other women. And, you know, so I waded into the web and looked for all the possible websites, but what I found was not what I considered to be supportive. Uh, What I found was um, constant exhortations uh, to be positive, cheerful, and uh, even to the extent of embracing the cancer and saying that this was a gift, uh, that this was a good thing in my life, that I should be glad was happening to me. So I felt really alienated. Do you remember the Lance Armstrong quote? I, I, I now have this slipped out of my head. Yeah, he it's said like, uh, cancer was the best thing that ever happened to him. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's just kind of amazing. And then, you know, just to give a sense of, I mean, we all understand people are trying to, like, buoy themselves in this situation, but one of the most telling moments was when you described how you went onto a website and posted what seemed to be a perfectly normal reaction to being diagnosed with cancer and having to deal with chemotherapy. So can you talk about that incident? Yeah, I went on to the Komen Foundation's website. Now, Komen, K-O-M-E-N, is the largest of the breast cancer foundations, I think, in Mm -hmm. in America. And they, uh, at that time, had a very active um, message board. So I put up a posting under the subject line, angry. And it was not, believe me, I don't think it was a crazy rant. I mentioned problems with the insurance company. Uh, I Then I said, uh, why don't we know the cause of this disease anyway? It's epidemic. Uh, it's obviously got some environmental or lifestyle kind of um, risk uh, causation or ideological factors, but we don't know what they are. And finally, you know, it just seemed to me that the treatments are barbaric. Um, right. Chemotherapy, well, look, what's the idea there? Kill all the cells in the body that are dividing and hope you get the cancer cells in the process. 
Well, that's too bad for the, um, you know, the hair follicles, the, the lining of the mouth, the lining of the stomach and intestine, and, and so many other parts of the body where you have dividing cells. So, you know, I thought this, this is pretty, the state of the art here is pretty ghastly. Anyway, I put, I put this out under that subject line, angry. And I got one supportive response uh-huh. from a woman who was in within months of dying. Uh, you know, her, her cancer had metastasized. Uh-huh. And then mostly they were like, Barb, um, you better run, not walk, to get some counseling. Right, right. This the is the not assumption permissible. being that you're making yourself sicker, right? The assumption yeah. being that you're, you're preventing your own recovery. No, you know? at first I didn't quite get that, but then I began to see that was the dogma, uh, that attitude will get you through this. That if you're right. positive and cheerful and accepting and happy about your cancer, uh, you will you're much more likely to get over it. Right. Um, so let's go from there and move to the history of it because one connection I hadn't made. I mean, I have read with sort of great rage like Marion Williamson and Deepak Chopra and just this notion that like you you know your your attitude can have some effect over the AIDS virus or cancer or things like that, right? Which you know all yoga stores and retreat are sort of full of this idea and it always makes me crazy. So um, reading about the or the, the, the you, you call it the dark roots of the right. American before we get to that though, just one thing, Hannah, can I yeah. can I throw in <coughs> there appears there's been nothing to this. Right, I mean, there right. now we have um, the the meta studies that were done in 2007, uh, showing no uh, connection whatsoever between any you know measures of mood or attitude and recovery from breast cancer and a number of other cancers that have been looked into. Well, that's one good service you did is is dissect the studies both about the immune system. I mean, there's there's gradations here, right, about sort of attitude and disease. It's just the specificity of claims having to do with kind of immune system or particular kinds of diseases. Can we draw that distinction? Well, um, the the underlying the dogma about why a positive attitude would get you through cancer better was the statement, assumption, I, I think I must have heard it so many times I hadn't even totally questioned it, and that is that your attitude affects your immune system. And right. Now, right. it is true, and enough laboratory animals have died in torment uh, to establish this, that enough stress uh, compromises the immune system and in general leads to disease. But the you know flip side of that that you know being more cheerful or something will boost the immune system. There's there's not evidence for that. It, worse still, uh, there's no evidence that the immune system combats cancer, or the, at least right. the kinds of cancer that we are talking about. In fact, there's some bizarre, um, recent but growing evidence that uh, the immune cells that first arrive at a tumor site <laughs> often go over to the other side. And right. help it grow, which right. I must say. See, my my, I have a PhD in cellular uh-huh. immunology. I might as well bring that out right here. Right. And that was. Oh, I didn't know that. I know. I, that's important here because, um, I it was returning me to some of my very old um, intellectual stomping grounds. Uh huh. Oh well, that's helpful. That's helpful to know. I actually didn't know that. Um, so, um, right. So that's so that's one thing this book does really well is debunk some of the studies about the connections between the immune system and positive attitude, which are extremely widely believed because we are in this moment where, you know, sort of new age thinking kind of colors uh, all, all sorts of religion. It's not like you have to be sort of Hare Krishna to believe this. This is just kind of widely out there in our culture and a part of many religions. Um, and we'll talk about religion in a moment. But first, let's um, move for a moment into the, the, the roots of this, the sort of Christian science, uh, Mary Baker Eddy. Uh, I had not put these uh, dots together. So can you just can you just talk about that, sort of the reaction to Calvinism and then the kind of reaction back again, but just first the reaction to Calvinism and sort of what it what it was about. Yeah, I was fascinated to know where this positive thinking began in American culture. Uh, and I'm really kind of sympathetic with the founders, with the original people, uh, who uh-huh. were uh, kind of um, interesting oddballs who were not formally educated, people like uh, Phineas Parkhurst Quimby, a watch repairman, in Maine, uh, and Mary Baker Eddy, uh, who became the founder of the Christian Science um, religion, 
And they, I'm sympathetic to them because they were reacting to the dominant uh, Calvinism, which said that we are all wretched sinners, uh, most likely doomed to eternal torment. Mm -hmm. And this was an ideology that it was actually making people sick. You right. know, there was a, an epidemic of invalidism in the 19th century, especially among middle-class women. Uh, right. And, and you can see, you know, its roots have been traced by other um, historians to this religious melancholy, in part, mm -hmm. as well as things about the role of women and the limits on that at the time. Uh, so, you know, people like Quimby and Mary Baker Eddy were saying, hey, it's not that bad. God doesn't hate us. Um, you know, and then you have Ralph Waldo Emerson coming along within a few uh, years, reinforcing that, saying we can get rid of this old religion. This is a bountiful land. We can pretty much do whatever we want to do. Mm -hmm. And and that those are the, you know, I would say almost uh, somewhat attractive uh, origins of positive thinking in the 19th right. century. Right. Um, and then what happened? I mean, then sort of it expands and takes a turn back in the other direction, which, which you know, another sort of startling uh, insight that you have. Yeah. Well, uh, by the time you enter the 20th century, uh, this has ceased to be so much a healing method, although we still see that, of course, in cases like breast cancer, as it has become um, a means to achieve wealth and success. Right. So you get a lot of bestsellers in the early um, 20th century, uh, right up to the biggie, which was um, The Power of Positive Power. Thinking by Norman yeah. Vincent Peale, which yeah. all about individual uh, success and how you can achieve it uh, through the powers of your mind alone. And right. then <laughs> the ironic thing to me is that this in this version, uh, positive thinking begins to resemble nothing so much as Calvinism because you have right. to be constantly monitoring your mood uh, right. and you have to be looking for negative thoughts and stamping them out. Uh, you, you, you have to be reciting affirmations uh, like, um, uh, you know, I will succeed, I, I'm wonderful, and, you know, so on and, and all the time or um, visualizing what it is you want. So it becomes a new kind of mental discipline, um, as arduous at least as um, Calvinism has been, had been. Yes, and the, and the failures to do so are evident, right? You make yourself sick, like you you're unsuccessful, right? So it's not there's a judgment that comes with failing to do those things properly, in the same way as there was a judgment that comes with Calvinism. Right, or the other way to put it, from a marketing point of view, is if the method doesn't work, you know, if you buy the book. Uh, that's going to tell you how to attract money to yourself, like um, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind was a recent bestseller, um, mm -hmm. and it doesn't work, well, you just didn't try hard enough. You know, right. You, right. you didn't put enough heart and fervor into those affirmations and so on. R Right, and that's the kind of underlying assumption or actually the stated, you know, the stated sort of belief of like a Deepak Chopra, Marianne Williamson. You sort of oh, didn't yeah. put enough into it, you know, as it is with the prosperity gospel and various other things. Like you weren't a true believer, you didn't think hard enough. Now, um, I want to move into the 20th century because that's, I think, you know, the, the impact on corporate culture and on American religion and particularly uh, very recently is something I'm, I'm extremely interested in and want to talk about. But before before I go there, I just want to ask you this. I mean, one thing um, about the Norman Vincent Peel, Peel chapter that you didn't get into, um, and having done some research myself, you know, there was a reason why this ideology took hold. And, and, and to me, I think, and I want to talk about this, that reason was fairly powerful. You know, it did come around at the time when people thought of that riches were accessible to more people, you know, a certain breakdown of kind of landed classness, right? Mm -hmm. That it wasn't the Protestant work ethic anymore, which was only accessible to the, the Rockefellers and friends. So, you know, I did feel that we had to stop and acknowledge there is a reason why people, you know, why this is a kind of powerful American idea, as Norman Vincent Peale put it, that you had the power to change your own life circumstances, not just Rockefeller, but you also had the power. So I wondered what you thought about that, because it did have some role in kind of breaking down class hierarchies. Yes, I think that's a, an, idea, uh, you know, an idea you can only have where there is class mobility 
It's not mm-hmm. an idea that could have existed uh, very easily, say, in, uh, in you know in the late medieval period or something in Europe. But here, there there was apparent class mobility, and there was at the time in the mid middle of the 20th century more than there is now, in fact. But the another factor uh, feeding into this, though, is by the middle of the 20th century, more and more Americans are not working with their hands or on mm-hmm. the land or with objects uh, and mm-hmm. tools. They're working with or on other people, trying to sell them things, trying to get their ideas across, trying to impress them in some way. And so it was, you know, a, a new, in the world, how do you control that? What, what, how do you, you know, one of the impo- very important books in this genre was um, How to Win Friends and influence, and influence people, people yeah. uh, which is just said, your your new environment that you are, your work environment is a is an all human thing, and mm-hmm. you've got to now remake yourself because success no longer depends on experience or skills. It now depends on what kind of vibe or you know what kind of something you what you beam out to other people. Right. 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 So you feel like it created, like while it did, it it sort of started as maybe a point of opportunity, you know, it started with this notion that people could sort of take control of their own circumstances. It did, it ultimately set up an impossible standard that people could not meet. Well, yes. And, 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 you know, and there are other things you could say, you know, right at the get-go about this is that it's very individualistic. Um, The idea of upward mobility through uh, collective action or right. trade union formation or something like that is, is ruled out. It's all coming from inside uh, your head. Right, right, I see. So it does kind of, it, do, it does preclude other things. And that's interesting because that's sort of the experience of this church that I have been spending some time at. But um, <clears throat> let's move on uh, because I, I, I love the chapter about uh, how positive thinking kind of took over corporate culture and created this sort of cult of the CEO. In other words, it wasn't just about sort of your skill set and kind of the institution working together, but this kind of mystical CEO that, you know, by their intuition or whim could just kind of, you know, change things on a dime and kind of intuit their way magically through these situations. Um, so can you talk about its spread and corporate mm-hmm. culture? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it was originally brought in um, as a way of motivating salespeople. Uh, uh-huh, and for Norman right. Vincent Peale, you know, he, he was always on the lecture circuit, uh, but for, for sales meetings, sales conventions, right. he was m- very much in demand for that. You gotta, and you know, it's kind of understandable. It's tough to be a salesperson. You know, and face rejection and have to pump yourself up for the next client, so potential right. client, so, so on. But when I uh, first encountered this in corporate America, I was doing some, research, doing some research in 2004 and 2005, and what I was encountering it was um, in the case of people who were being uh, downsized, laid off, mm-hmm. white-collar workers, and they were being told something very similar to what I had heard as a breast cancer patient, which is that right. this is not a misfortune. This is a wonderful opportunity you should embrace, and that you're going to get out of this if you're just positive, because that's why somebody will hire you and so on. And I, that's, you know, that's what I guess is unique about me here is that I was able to connect those two dots uh, right. from my own experience. I thought, oh, my God, you know, they're right. saying the same thing. To people right. who are really victimized, and of course right. the word "victim" is not allowed right. anymore. But I, I, what puzzled me is I always had this belief that business had to be rational, that American corporate management had to be ultimately rational. Now I'm very critical. I have not always been critical of many corporations on many grounds, even the idea of the corporation. But I thought they were rational, right? It's about numbers, right. you know. Bottom line, in the end, you can't, you know, um, you have to do analyses, I thought. So right. the, the big shock to me was to see that this ideology wasn't just being used to quell dissent among the ranks who were facing downsizing, but that it was shared by people at higher and higher levels. The right. idea that you can control the world with your thoughts which sounds bonkers to me to say that out loud, but uh, by the late 90s, uh, Forbes and Business Week and everything were reporting on the, the new wave of spirituality in American business. 
And uh, sometimes the line was, you know, we don't have time to think anymore or analyze or do those decision trees we used to do. Things are moving right. too fast for that. So now we rely on insight, almost mystical insight. You found executives right. going off to vision quest weekends. Right. Uh, and uh, or drumming circles or sweat lodges. Well, we recently lost some people in a sweat lodge in right. Arizona. Right. Um, but um, right. you know, uh, and I when I, I put this to those insiders who I was able to interview, uh, they you know the the more forthcoming were able to say, yeah, this stuff is viral, and then also at the very top levels. Because right. at, the, at the very top levels, you've got guys now making tens of millions of dollars a year who are completely insulated, or can be if they want to be, completely insulated from criticism or doubts or questions about the business plan. Why? Mm -hmm. Because no one wants to be the bearer of bad news. Right. Right. And right. In, the, in the years leading up to the financial meltdown of 2008, um, people were being fired for saying, whoa, wait a minute, um, I think our subprime exposure may be too high. Or, for example, the um, guy at Lehman Brothers who was in charge of the real estate division in 2006, he went to his boss, the CEO, and said, uh, I think this housing thing is a bubble. So he was fired because that was right. negative. Right. So right. It, it was like this this weird rebellion against rationality that went on right. in the corporate world, including the finance sector. Right, right. Although, did, at some level, doesn't it just substitute for wealth? In other words, there, it's not as if, you know, leadership was accessible to all sorts of people, you know, in the pre-war period, let's say. I mean, leadership, was, leadership of corporations was even more restricted. Sort of now it's just restricted or insulated in a slightly different way. Well, it's, yeah. I mean, there was a big change in the idea of who could be a CEO, what it meant to be a CEO, say, from the, um, from the 70s to the, to the 90s. Uh, it, earlier on, it was, you know, it would be somebody who'd been, worked his, and usually it was his way up, and who knew a lot about the company, all aspects of the product and so on, the business. Um, by the end of the 90s, it was um, the CEO was seen more as a celebrity, as right. uh, somebody who had great charisma, who right. would be well known. Um, whoever knew the names of CEOs before, you know, it was just you know, in Jack Welch and thereafter, you be, they, they began to be. Um, right. Big shot uh, celebrity. Right. I guess I'm just wanting to acknowledge the fact that this culture does produce a certain accessibility, even with all the kind of demented things that it brings to it. You know, it's almost it produce. It's almost like it rises at the same time as reality television, when <laughs> celebrity is sort of more democratic, but also kind of more, but also suffocating in just kind of different ways than it used to be. Um, yeah. No, I see your point, but. Uh, I think I'd still rather have my retirement funds managed by a company uh, run by a person who really knew the business rather than who just gave off fantastically optimistic vibes. <laughs> right, exactly, like some guy whose name you don't know. I don't care about He's an name. excellent accountant, right. I hear you, I hear you. Um, so let's move on to churches. This is an area I know extremely well. I've written about religion for a long time. And in fact, I'm, uh, uh, in, the, in the next issue of The Atlantic, I um, coincidentally have a piece coming out that makes a very similar point to your prosperity gospel. You don't call it prosperity gospel. You just call it positive theology. But um, to the connection between that kind of gospel and... Um, and um, and the mortgage crisis. And, you know, one thing I found, which you found as well, is that looking at American religion, which I have been doing for a long time now, uh, you know, it seems that the most recent phenomenon, which no one really is paying attention to, is that the Christian right, which we're used to talk, talking about and criticizing, the proto-Calvinist kind of harsh Christian right, has been really almost, you know, very much supplanted by this kind of positive theology. That is, as churches has become 
become more like corporations and the megachurch has taken over the American landscape over the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, um, they have picked up a lot of this corporate ideology of positive thinking. Um, and so can you talk about your visit to the uh, the most successful church in America, which is mm-hmm. uh, Joel and Victoria Austin's <laughs> church? Because I just thought that was just a fantastic little episode there. Yeah, well, why? what's behind mega churches anyway? The, the whole idea was that you made religion user-friendly. Uh, right. or seeker-friendly. They, they'll say seeker-friendly. And that means you can't have hard pews. You should have theater seats. Um, you, um, you you stop with the, the fire and brimstone preaching because, ooh, that's, you know, so negative to right. hear on your one day off from work and chores and so right. on. Uh, and you, you dispense with all... Um, Symbols, overt symbols of Christianity. Now, this right. is, there are exceptions among the mega churches, but for the most part, uh, like the one I visited, Lakewood Church, the largest mega church in America in Houston, not a cross, not a crucifix. Right. Why? Right. Because you know what a bummer to right. think of the torture right. of Christ, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. So we don't go there in the mega churches. It's all about God wants to prosper you. Uh, and, you know, he, he intends for you to have all the nice things as uh, or nice stuff, as Joyce Meyer, one of the prosperity preachers, would put it. Uh, and it, it's, it's supposed to be a feel-good message. And, yes, I, I link that to um, the, mortgage, the subprime mortgage crisis because, as, as I, I can't wait to read what you have to say about this, too, but uh, also... So does Kevin Phillips and a few other people. Um, that you know, there are a lot of people who could never get a mortgage. Uh, they right. didn't make enough money. Their credit was bad, or because of racism. Suddenly, someone comes along and offers you a really amazing mortgage. You know, no down payment, nothing. Right. And then you think, hey, the pastor just said last Sunday that the Lord wanted to reach down and bless me with a larger house. This must right. be it. Now, is that the kind of thing that you're you're arguing? Oh, it was extremely explicit. I mean, you know, well, I mean, I, you know, this is, I really know a lot about this, so I don't want to go on for too long. But for one thing, I, you know, I do draw a distinction. I mean, I think what happened with megachurches is that what these megachurches, like Willow Creek, you know, in the beginnings of the megachurch movement started to, inco- they were sort of incorporating this in their kind of, outlook in their architecture, you know, the things that you mentioned, no symbols, and then kind of something very different happened in the last 10, 15 years, which is that uh, churches started to incorporate this into their theology, mm-hmm. right? So it became part of the theology, not just part of sort of, you know, we're client friendly, we, we, we have our pews this way and that way. And then something really, you know, dramatic happened, um, because the prosperity gospel was something we used to associate with like, Tammy Faye Baker. I mean, we feel like that era kind of ended, right, when those guys sort of exploded and they all went down in shame. And now it's kind of crept back up and taken over the megachurch in this very respectable fashion. So that's sort of part one is the very recent history of this. But part two, the connection to the mortgage crisis, you know, it's very explicit. Like when Oral Roberts, who's the kind of founder of this theology um, and the, the language for it, he, all of his early uh, testimonies used to talk about cars, right? They used to say, like, you know, I I, you know, and then God told me that I was going to have this green Oldsmobile and it was going to have these rims that look like this. And then suddenly I went to the car lot and um, and there was this and the guy gave me this free green Oldsmobile. Right. And so that's how it was sort of in the in the post-war period. And now, you know, if you read Joel Austin's book and you quote actually a similar passage that I do, it's like. He actually says, like, he talks about, you know, there are these houses and there, you know, there are these ranch houses and they're kind of flat and they're not worth very much. And, oh, then I see this two-story house and I really can't afford it. Like, I looked at my bank statement and I can't afford it. And then, you know, God bless me with the house. Mm-hmm. It doesn't explain mm-hmm. kind of where the money came from or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And if you talk to people who have, um, who study this subject, there's a few scholars who focus specifically on the prosperity gospel. They'll tell you that almost all the testimonies during these last 10 years were very explicitly, I went to the loan officer, I thought I could never afford a house, but lo and behold, they gave me a loan, so God must want to bless me with a house. Right. I mean, it, it's not, this isn't like hard to draw this line, you know what I mean? It's not subtle. So, um, so yeah. Well, I'm I glad you could see the, the line clear, you know, that you're, you found out more about this. I just throw out another example I learned about more recently, which is 
that Wells Fargo went into the black churches with what they called wealth building seminars. I talked to oh, that you woman. Oh, you talked about this? I, okay, great. No, I called the woman who you, she, she was in that New York Times story, Beth Jacobson, and I actually called her, and yes, that's exactly what she said. She said she, they realized that that was an untapped audience. You know, it's so funny when you think about redlining, how there was all this discrimination. You know, I guess it's not funny, but, you know, for so many years, like, there was redlining against African-American and Latino neighbors. Nobody could actually get a loan. And then suddenly it became the opposite. It was like, oh, black church, let's go in there and, you know, tell the pastor, like, you know. And Beth Jacobson even said to me, she said, we didn't go to these seminars and tell people, like, we want to give you a subprime mortgage. We would say, like, well, don't you want your parishioners to have a house? Like, don't you want them to have the American dream? And so anyway, so yes, that's exactly what would happen, um, is that they, you know, created these markets called emerging markets. Um, and, you know, and in fact, the, the, the church that I focus on is a church in which the guy who runs the church was both the pastor of the church and a loan officer at Countrywide um, as he was founding this church, which is why I wow. picked it. Um, but, um, but yeah, so you can see the kind of, you can see the threads and the connections. And it's not like you can, you know, blame the pastors. It's just like these things kind of bubbled up at the same time in American culture where everyone came to believe that, you know, this was possible. Like the American, you know, even though you didn't have money, sort of Jackson Lears' book um, 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 about luck, uh, kind of makes this point that sort of there's this connection between grace and gambling and like suddenly you'd get this sort of unearned bounty would just kind of come down to you. You know, it's almost the opposite of the Protestant work ethic. It just kind of appears to you and that's what seems to have dominated in the last few years. Oh, that's anyway, fascinating. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I just want to say, I mean, the the racial aspect of this is it's so tragic. You know, African yeah. Americans and Latinos were excluded from mortgages, you know, in until rather recently, so they they were a a very a, you know a, a ready-made market uh, when they decided right. to come along and give uh, you know with these dodgy mortgages uh, and, right. and a lot you know I, I don't have the number right in my head but uh, you know a high proportion of blacks uh, who were given subprime mortgages could have actually qualified for prime mortgages. Yeah, huge. The differences are enormous in sort of white. Uh, then Latino and then African American sort of nobody has numbers on foreclosures but people have numbers on who were given subprime loans right. and the distinctions are just you know 40% more likely for Latinos 80% more likely for African Americans it's a huge difference here's the one thing I want to bring up here and then we'll move on, move on to the um, the positive psychology which I'm also interested in um, you know I did spend some time at this church I chose a small community so I could sort of get to know people um, it, you know I have to say like it did do a lot for them like in almost all cases like these were people uh who were kind of you know had been drug addicts that sort of come here from mexico or guatemala extremely poor you know were just kind of living in a hole like full of fury and rage until they found this place like i'm not saying it's the place they should have found but i really i can't gloss over the fact that it did kind of force them into a, a sort of a rightness and a positivity and a feeling that they had an entitlement to certain things that they never would have had without it. And I, you know, I, I, I don't, I just want to say that. I don't know how to put it all together, but it's certainly what I found. Mm -hmm. Well, the P Pentecostal uh, churches, which are the, that's, you know, insofar as they're denominational at all, that's the principal sort of theme, a stream in the prosperity gospel, positive thinking type of gospel. Uh, you know, are very, very popular worldwide among the poor, the poor right, and growing. Right, right, uh, right. And, you know, as against, say, Catholic, the Catholic Church, which still, you know, clings to that very um, sad um, view of human nature and, you know, of, well, I shouldn't say sad, but the, that tragic narrative of Jesus' suffering. Uh, right, that, you know, right. Get rid of that, just focus on getting the, getting the stuff now. Yeah, and I guess just in America what happens is that it translates into a kind of commercial success as opposed to a kind of other kind of success. You know, like in this church I was at, everyone, it's a detail I point out in the piece, everyone has really nice cell phones, you know. That they, I don't know if they can afford such a but instead of the, nobody takes the free cell phones that comes with the plan because with this sense of kind of entitlement to an American dream, which has many positive aspects, um, and if it hits the right person, can really kind of send them soaring into a better life. There's also this sort of, it, it expresses itself in a kind of literal, material way often. Mm -hmm. Um, let's move on to this positive psychology. Um, for, for a different project I'm doing, um, uh, 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 at 
doublex.com, the, the mm-hmm. Slate website, um, called the non the non whining project. Um, not like that Kansas preacher you write about, but I've started to read Leo Bermirsky, if that's how you pronounce Leo her name. Bermirsky, yeah, I think. Yeah, and Martin Seligman, mm-hmm. and I will say that. Um, well, first of all, talk about the academic part of this, and kind of you know when it came about, and what it is as distinct from the kind of you know just popular self-help literature. So, what is the what is the what is the academic version of of positive psychology? Well, positive psychology was first you know started, I mean founded in a way, announced by uh, Dr. Martin Seligman, a psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania. In about 1998, when he was elected to the presidency of the American Psychological Association, I think actually the idea was great. I loved the idea that, as it was originally uh, enunciated, that that positive psychology would look at uh, states like happiness and joy, uh-huh. etc., rather than just neurosis and you know, you know, uh, all the psych- it, right. psych- psychopathology. So that sounded uh, very good. Um, but it, it that, then it becomes increasingly difficult to distinguish from the non-academic versions. Um, right. I mean, the, then you find um, the people like Seligman and the people he trains. There's a graduate uh, program, for example, a master's degree program in positive psychology at Penn. Basically, trains uh-huh. people to be uh, corporate uh, coaches and right, um, right. motivational speakers and, and so forth. Right. So it's harder and harder to tell the difference. And then that's where, right. you know, I get into real, um, I get real tr- problems with uh, positive psychology is that they <laughs> over-accentuate the positive in the data. Uh, right. You know, there it, it is, you know, uh, uh, arguments, for example, about how much ha- your being positive or optimistic or happy affects longevity. That's a right, really interesting right. question. And right. the answers are all over the place. Right, Seligman right. himself uh, co-authored a study um, finding that elderly people in nursing homes, the more can- cantankerous ones, did uh-huh. better. But he doesn't right. mention that study in his book, Authentic Happiness, strangely. You know, so it, they kind of went, you know, started really pushing this. You can, people will be healthier. You can get more work out of them. You can be more successful. If you learn to be optimistic, and we have the ways to teach you or to help right. you become happy and optimistic. And so they, when I attended the, the last uh, positive psychology um, conference I attended in Washington, D.C. in, in 07, uh, it, it overlapped very significantly with the whole cor- corporate coaching business. Some of the speakers right. were academics. Some of the speakers were uh, corporate coaches who, you know, go into corporations and have, you know, the 17-point plan to make everybody right. in your workforce right. happy. So right. I can't see the uh, difference anymore. That is really helpful. Okay, that's helpful. And your chapter, your, you know, with Martin Seligman, where he's fairly squirrely, kind of lays this out. Because I actually, having started to read these books, it's, you know, when, when they talk about their own science of it, you know, the, the sort of parts of your happiness you can control and you cannot control, it sounded to me very much like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is, you know, fairly mm-hmm. straightforward. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, it's sort of, you know, change certain behavior, you know, it's, it's as a reaction to Freud, kind of as a reaction to the idea of focusing on psychopathology, this idea that you could focus on kind of habits and behaviors and affect a certain percentage of your own well-being, this seemed fine, you know. Oh, yeah, um, I actually that up got kind of something science. years ago out from cognitive uh, therapy, self-help, the self-help version. I used to be terrified of public speaking, and uh-huh. I learned this technique of writing down my fears and then refuting them uh, from a right. book. Well, I think it was called something like Feeling Better. The name of the book was very simple. Um, and, you know, coming to getting a little more real, realistic that I was not likely to break into projectile vomiting at the podium. Right. You know, uh, that's helpful. Right. Uh, but this is turned into something else altogether. Um, yeah. 
I can see that. That really is a shame because you wish that the popular version, that is the problem right there, that if they had just stuck to the sort of, you know, that is an interesting academic premise to study something other than psychopathology. Mm -hmm. And it is an you know, and social, and I think that cognitive behavioral therapy was initially founded to solve the very problem you're talking about, which was social phobia, you know, to give people specifics. In your case, it's, you know, public speaking, but some, you know, variation, that to give people specific strategies to deal with going to a party, writing down their fears. I mean, if you see a cognitive behavior psychologist, that's exactly what they'll do, is what you were doing, is they'll give you a sheet which will tell you to write down your fears and what's the likely outcome, and then sort of to test out certain things, and you know, it's all, it's not necessarily scientific, but it's pretty methodical, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah, the other so thing that was anyway, going, yeah, that I think I is what you going mean. on. So the problem is not in the, mm -hmm. in the kind of origins of the science, the problem is in that they have just become sort of more life coaches. Well, yeah, I, you know, I, um, don't want to reduce everything to this, but the psychology profession has been in a real crisis. Right, uh, you know, right. uh, a, a general practitioner can prescribe antidepressants. Right, uh, right. A psychologist can't because of uh, right. what absurd rules. And, uh, you know, insurance companies will not pay for extended talk therapy anymore. Right, right. Now, those right. things were completely obvious by the late 90s when Seligman declared positive psychology, which in a way was announcing a new market. We're not right. going uh, for the sick person, the suffering person, the neurotic uh, person. We're going for the so-called normal person, the regular person who wants to be better, who wants right. more, to succeed more or whatever. Right, right. Right, right. It was a new market. That's exactly what it was, and that is really essentially what the problem was. Because if it was, if this was just sort of an academic book like Lou Morsky's book that one was coming across, but in fact you sort of go on the website and it's clear that you know she, he, everyone in this field is sort of packaging themselves as kind of you know coach, charismatic figure. And I actually would love to go to one of those conferences because I'm very curious about it now. Um, okay, I feel like we've depleted the topic. That was fantastic. We've run through your book. Is there any sort of last things you want to say, uh, things that I failed to cover about the book, you know, things you've learned as you've gone on the book tour, you know, have you gotten sort of, host, you know, sort of hostility, kind of what's wrong with you, what's wrong with being happy, like have you gotten that response? No, or? you know, I just came back from uh, two weeks on the road and it's very gra been very gratifying. I don't often say that about anything as arduous as a book tour, but that so, you know, so often the response is thank you. And this is coming from people who've been through very serious illnesses or bereavement or layoffs and, just, you know, had people come and tell them, oh, aren't you over that yet? Just think positively and move beyond it or whatever. Right. And being totally hurt and insulted right. by that response. Right. So I feel right. like I've been tapping into that, and I try to make it perfectly clear that I'm not saying that I romanticize suffering or negativity. In fact, right, negativity, right. it can be just as delusionary. The alternative right. really is realism, thinking, you know, right, right. <laughs> trying to see things as they are. Right, and that's you know I, I really I'm I, we're, I I'm I'm spiritually and sort of temperamentally so with you and was as I started this book. I mean realism and skepticism there should be a place for those. Like the sugar coating of negativity is something that has sort of driven me crazy my entire life. And my parents being Israeli were sort of you know crankiness is kind of the order of the day. You mean sugar coating of positivity? No, sugar coating of negativity. negativity oh, in other words, oh. the kind of coating things oh. in cheer, which are actually genuinely uncheerful, just always seemed so pointless to me. But, um, uh, but, but so, so I, I really, I appreciated the book. Thanks. Um, well, good. I'm glad it's being well received. Um, I'm sure it will be ever more well received. And, um, and uh, unless you have something else to add, I just want to thank you for doing this conversation. No, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Great. Thank you so much.